Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lord and Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery. Today's case is called The Other Suspect. It was a warm spring day on Tuesday, March 25th, 1975, and sisters Catherine and Sheila Lyon were on the second day of their Easter vacation and very excited. The 10 and 12 year old girls were going to walk to the mall in Wheaton, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, DC, that was only two miles from their home in Kensington. While there, they would browse the Easter exhibits and have lunch at the Orange Bowl, a pizza parlor at the mall. By 11 a.m., the girls were on their way, taking a shortcut that led them through several side streets and a small patch of woods. Their mother, Mary, had allowed the girls to stay out there most of the day, but they had to be home no later than four o'clock. At 5.45, Mary was annoyed. The girls still weren't home. As more time passed, her annoyance turned to worry. And when they still weren't home at 7 p.m., she and her husband, John, made the decision to call police. Officers conducted an extensive search of the area, but didn't find the girls. Luckily, they were able to track their movements with verifiable witness accounts. At one o'clock, the family's neighbor saw the girls together outside the Orange Bowl, talking to an unidentified man. While purchasing a kite, their older brother Jay saw the two of them at 2 p.m. at the same restaurant eating pizza. Soon after, a friend saw them walking westward down the street near the mall, seeming like they were heading home. And that's where the trail ends. When officers asked around about the unknown man, witnesses stated that he was 50 to 60 years old, wore a brown suit, and carried a briefcase with a tape recorder inside. Some children were asked to speak into the microphone he held. Composite sketches were drawn up, and soon more people came forward from Wheaton and the surrounding towns. They claimed that the man was asking the children to help him record answering machine messages. Investigators weren't able to find the man. Another sighting from a close friend of the girls claimed that a long-haired man at the mall had leered at the two for so long, she actually confronted him about it. The composite sketch of this man was very different from the unknown businessman's. This one showed a young man in his late teens to early 20s who was poorly dressed and had acne and scars on his left cheek. While officers focused on tracking down the businessman with the briefcase, this second sketch was largely forgotten. A week after their disappearance, officers received a promising call. A security guard at the Wheaton Mall came to say a local man had told him he saw the girls being abducted from the mall by a man. The description that he gave fit the current sketch of the businessman perfectly. When he came to the station to be questioned, the new witness, a young man named Lloyd Welch, gave elaborate details. Investigators felt that his story seemed off somehow, and they gave him a polygraph test, which he failed. When Welch was confronted with the results, he admitted that he had lied to the officers. They wrote his attempt off as nothing more than a grab for attention and possibly reward money. Across the top of the report that they had taken from Welch, the word lied was written, and it was tossed into the back of the file. In the following months, every stretch of forest was searched, as well as storm drains, vacant houses, and waterways. At the end of May, the National Guard was brought in to help, but still nothing was found. Two weeks into the search, a witness in Manassas, Virginia, reportedly saw the girls bound and gagged in the back of a 1968 Ford station wagon. They also claimed the driver fit the description of the businessman. At first, investigators found the report credible, but when no leads came of the sighting, they deemed it questionable. One extortionist demanded $10,000, and when a drop was established, containing far less than the amount asked for, it was never even picked up. When the man called the family a second time, they demanded proof that the girls were alive. They were never contacted by the man again. Other persons of interest were investigated. One man named Raymond Rudolph Molesky Sr. lived near the mall and had quite the police record, but officers could not directly connect him to the disappearance. 
As decades went by, many detectives worked on the Lyon sisters' cold case, but it would take a whole new team of investigators to see something that had been overlooked for 36 years. While working their way through the file from start to finish, investigators noticed the report filed by Welch in 1977. They also noticed that he had long hair, some scarring on his face. This guy fit the description of the leering man given by the sister's friend who was at the mall that day. It was now 2013, and Lloyd Welch was serving a 33-year prison sentence related to indecent acts with children, just one charge on the very long list making up his criminal record. Once investigators reviewed his statement, they felt that, at the very least, Welch had witnessed the murders. At one point, he described one of the perpetrators as having a limp. Investigators knew that Molesky, one of their previous persons of interest in the investigation, also had a limp. On October 16, 2013, investigators had their first prison interview with Welch. They were initially afraid that he wouldn't talk, but he not only agreed to speak to them, he talked for hours. His first words to them were, I know why you're here. You're here about those two missing kids. At first, he denied any involvement in the Lion sisters' deaths, but over several interviews, finally admitted that he had helped in the kidnapping of Catherine and Sheila, but nothing more. He claimed that his uncle, father, and cousin were actually responsible. He said it was his uncle who orchestrated the crime, and once the girls were abducted, they were taken to his uncle's house, the location of which seemed to change with each telling, where the three men then drugged and assaulted the girls before killing them. Their remains were placed into two duffel bags and then taken into the woods where they were incinerated. Now, investigators had to verify his claims and sort through what were the lies and what was the truth. The description of the house that the girls were taken to didn't seem to fit the description of his uncle's home, so investigators decided to look at Welch's old house. After the current owner gave consent, the detectives walked to the entrance of the basement which could only be accessed from outside the home. The space was a perfect match for Welch's awful tale. And when luminol was sprayed in there, investigators saw the walls, floor, and ceiling glow brightly. They next went to his family's homestead on Taylor's Mountain in Bedford, Virginia. After an extensive search, they found an area that they considered to be a burn spot. And when they dug into the dirt, they found bone fragments. Unfortunately, the fragments were too degraded to test, but when officers talked to neighbors, they were told that during that march, back in 1977, the Welch family had a bonfire that burned for days and stunk terribly. After a year of additional investigation, in July of 2015, Welch was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. His trial would begin in September of 2017, but before the trial concluded, Welch agreed to plead guilty to the two counts. He was sentenced to two 48-year sentences. These sentences will be served concurrently after he's done serving the rest of his 33-year charge. He won't be eligible for parole until he's in his mid-80s. And even if he applies, it's not likely that he'll be granted parole. While talking to reporters, Welch claimed that he had told investigators all that he knew about that night he claimed that he didn't murder or kidnap them. Quote, just because a person pleads guilty to something doesn't mean they're guilty of it. The Welch family hold firm to their claims that they had nothing to do with it and it was carried out solely by Lloyd. Despite the bone fragments being found, the girl's remains have never been officially identified. The trauma that the Lyon family suffered was terrible, but as we frequently see in cases like this, helped inspire some good. Their older brother, Jay Lyon, went on to become a police officer. And their father, John, later worked as a victim counselor, helping others who had been impacted emotionally by crimes. As parents John and Mary Lyon walked out of the courtroom, they left reporters with their only statement. They said that they appreciated all the time and effort that law enforcement put into their daughter's case. Quote, We just want to say thank you. It's been a long time. We're tired, and we just want to go home. Case cracked. 
I would like to thank Oldest.org, The Washington Post, The New Zealand Herald, Meow.com, WTOP.com, WJLA.com, WSET.com, Newspapers.com, and of course, Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case. And here she is to discuss it with me now. Well, Christy, another very tough case. I feel like I say that for a lot of these episodes, but these cases that involve children, they just really weigh heavy on my heart. And um, especially just seeing the photos, seeing the area, like that's, we go to the mall as kids. I mean, it's it's the big adventure, you know? We're finally old enough to kind of go do something on our own. And I don't know, it just, it does a disservice it's terrible for what it does to the family, but yeah. it also does a disservice to the community when you do something like that because things change in that community and they they don't ever really go back. And admittedly, you know, we're talking about 1975. I get it. This 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 is a while ago. This is kind of back in the time where front doors are left open, children walking two miles, just a, a normal thing. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, you know, some of that would tighten up as the years go on. But uh, we did want to let all of you know that um, we did kind of clean up some of the darker details of this story. If you go looking into it for yourselves, um, there's some pretty graphic stuff in terms of what these poor kids went through. Uh, We tried to balance and, and find the line of letting you know the reality of what they went through to the point that was necessary to understand the investigation. So, uh, and I, I think, uh, Christy, I think you, you hit that right. And of course I worked on that a little bit with you as well. So that's something we're always trying to balance when it comes to sharing these stories. We're not trying to shock you guys and, you know, give you something like that. We, we are really trying to analyze these stories and figure out how they come together. And Christy, how do you feel? Isn't it kind of frustrating that the pieces of the puzzle were essentially in the case file? Well, you see it happen occasionally. I, it's amazing to me. It really is. I can't believe they had two sketches and they just tossed one to the back and forgot about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like because it came from, I'm assuming that this is a younger girl that said, you know, I saw it this. was, yeah, it was one of their peers from school. Yeah. So I think that they just kind of discounted the, the information maybe a little too hard early on. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, it's really interesting that you get this investigative team so many years later that just looks through it all again. And they're like, oh, wait, <laughs> this guy. Yeah, they picked up on it quick. Yeah, this guy matches this description. And he had some interesting details that, you know, and he failed a lie detector. Like the whole motivation for him even coming to law enforcement at that point, just everything shifts, you know, it changes mm-hmm. in light of that. So it's it's really weird they didn't catch that before. Um Now, you say that while you were doing your research, did it seem like police thought there was more than one person that conducted the kidnapping? Yeah. Yeah. They always felt that it would take, and I do too, it's going to take more than one person to get two young girls in a car, but they never could pin anybody else to this. They couldn't find anything. Uh, Welch's family stuck together and said nothing, and that was it. That's interesting too, because... Uh, you really don't know what to believe in this guy's information and Mm -hmm. they wind up verifying some of his information, but then they kind of don't verify the other part of his story, which is that, you know, Hey, my family members were involved in this as well. And they effectively can't, can't finish that part of the case. Yeah. Really strange. Um, and, but you are saying another family member, uh, faced a charge related to this investigation as well. Yes, it was actually the uncle's wife. She was charged with organizing family efforts to stonewall the investigation. So, I mean, honestly, if they had nothing to do with it, what's up with that? Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. Did she serve any time for that? Was that, do you know how far that, that charge went? That was all I found. Okay. No, that was all I found on it. Yeah, because I know sometimes they might do that if they wanted to kind of shake up the family a little bit or something, like lay, lay a charge like that, and then later it just never comes through or never gets fully prosecuted it did not work they stuck together yeah yeah uh and then molesky that story kind of goes off on its own and takes its own turn Uh, he winds up attacking his own family uh killing a few members uh sitting in prison and then ultimately dying in prison in 2004 um is there any reason to believe that he played any part in this Well, Molesky had a limp 
And that was something that Welch talked about was a man with a lamp, a man with a lamp. It, his stories were constantly changing and it was hard to keep up with them. But he continually mentioned a man with a lamp. Molesky yeah. had a lamp. He also lived in the area of the malls at the time that the businessman was seen. So they felt that maybe could he have been the businessman? Was he connected to the murder through Welch? They just really felt like he had something to do with it, but they couldn't figure out what. That's another tough aspect of uh, not looking like you would have to go through all the press at the time of this occurrence to understand what was being leaked through the media that Welch mm -hmm. was then picking up and working into his stories. Because yeah. if they, you know, if law enforcement was being clear, they had a person of interest and they had mentioned, you know, to some reporter about a guy's limp or you know, law enforcement talks about a person of interest, a reporter figures out who it is and then starts spilling some details of that guy personally. Welch reads that and then all of a sudden works it into the details of his story that he's telling them. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just so much potential for cross-contamination on that information. I just, I don't know um, how you really Well, he was so good about picking up different strains of conversations of little bits of truth here and there and weaving it into the truth of his own story. And I mean, it took investigators hours of interviews to start sorting through all that. Yeah. I mean, even his original pass at going to talk to them, he was basically trying to reaffirm where he saw their investigation heading already. It was like, yeah, yeah, there's uh, this businessman that I saw taking these these kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your help on this today, Christy. Really appreciate your insight and all your hard work. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters, Rita Maria Wanninger, Amanda Beard, and Melissa Heinbach. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, or buy merchandise. Case Cracked is frequently demonetized by YouTube, but we know learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon if you'd like to catch one of our weekly secret live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.